Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are on this planet Earth. And we're here with another edition of Wow's Alive with a man known as Ocean Walker. Welcome, Adam. Hey, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I mean, your journey to channels around the world is just uh, remarkable uh, and certainly unexpected. I mean, how did you go from water polo and selling, selling things to Mr. Ocean Walker? Oh my, God. it's like two different lives, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 2000, back end of 2006, I was on an airplane, bored, I put a movie on, it was called On A Clear Day. I thought it sounded pretty boring, but it was a sport movie, and I thought, well, okay, you know, this will bide some time. And it was about a man called Frank who loses his job in the boatyard looking for inspiration, he goes on to swim the English Channel. And... I something happened to me watching this movie and there's a bit in the movie where Frank is on the boat going to France because his friends take him on this drinking cruise and he looks out to sea and he goes how mad would you have to be to swim this and they're all like looking at him like well totally why would you do that and I put my earpiece down and for no apparent reason I said I'm going to swim the English Channel and, and bear in mind I hadn't swam for eight years and when I did swim it was backstroke it was never long distance it was never front crawl it was never outside so there was nothing to show me that i could do this apart from the fact i played water polo in goal yeah and that was that was it that was about as much as uh swimming was for me at that point so yeah i just wanted to test myself steve and and it just seemed yeah there's a picture yeah. you're bringing up of me uh yeah. pretty good egg to that actually i'm quite impressed with me getting out of the water but yeah, I, I got injured quite a bit, Steve, over the years. I had my first operation at 13, then 16 oh, wow. in my knees, uh, 18, another dislocation. And I played a lot of cricket, English sport. Oh, wait, uh, a, second, wait a second, wait a second. Now, hmm. you, you say yourself, I'm going to do the English channel. Not only were you not the field player, so you were not the swimmer in the game of water polo. You were a guy Correct. sitting in goal. I mean, your, your distance is five meters max. <laughs> I was going to say, no one could beat me over five meters, Steve. I was the best. <laughs> yeah, five meters. And uh, oh my God. when I started taking up the sport, I have to confess that I played out for the first game and our goalie got sent off. And they needed a goalie in goal and it was a shallow end. And I said, oh, I'll go in goal. I'm big. Yeah. And I saved the penalty. And I thought, well, this is much easier. Because you don't have to, um, you know, tread water. You can, yeah. you can basically stand up. But yeah. of course, as I got better and I started playing national league, I realised they lowered the floor, and it was a whole different ball game. So, you know, it it was a way of playing sport without getting injured. Because yeah. a lot of my land-based sports, um, I was injured. I mean, I broke school records at running when I was twelve, and that was the last time I can remember running properly with my knees. And I had a bad back from cricket. I was carried off the pitch with a bad back. So this was the only thing left in my life for sport. And I love sport. I did a degree in sports science. Okay. So when I watched that movie, I was like, ah, swimming? Every time I was injured as a kid, I went back into swimming. Okay. And, and, and then I was like straight away looking to get back on the field again when I was 13, 14, 15. Um, but no one really cared about swimming in the UK. And, you know, and no one really was this, to... what year this approximate when you saw the movie? So I saw the movie in 2006, back end of December 2006. And I trained up 18 months okay. from nothing, no coach, no club. What, just you, uh, what, did you go to the uh, neighborhood uh, pool? Did you go to the shore? How did, how did you, what were those 18 months? How did you prepare yourself? My first move was to go to the pool. I thought, I haven't been in the pool for years. Let's try and swim 45 minutes. How hard could that be? And that was pretty tough. I did 45 minutes out of stubbornness and rolled myself on the side, coughed and spluttered and, uh, and then thought, I'm really too unfit to do this. And then did another three sessions that week because I'm pretty stubborn. I thought, if I'm not good at something, try and get better. And then after, I think it was five months, I did five hours in the pool nonstop. Oh. And I started creating sets after that and trying to get faster. And you know, I've been a swimming coach for years, but more part-time. I had a full-time job, as you say, selling yes. kettles and toasters and 
so I didn't have time for coaching. Yeah. But I thought, you know, I've always been a swimmer. It can't be that hard. I've only had eight years out. How hard yeah. can it be? <laughs> now, how, okay, so you're 2006. How old are you? Are you in your... your... Uh, 27. So I did the English Channel when I was uh, 30. I tried to do it for my okay. 30th birthday. Okay. So now, I was, I you, 28. You're, yeah, so you're selling uh, pots and kettles. Yeah, kettles um, and toasters. Yeah, yeah. A, a toaster, sorry. Were you, were you very fulfilled with that? I mean, something had to click other than just selling. Yeah, stuff. I have to be very careful now because a lot of okay. people like sales and, and, and ex-colleagues yeah. and things. But no, you know, I, I, the, the truth is when I used to do that job and I did other sales jobs in between Ocean 7, which, which we'll get on to, but I did other jobs and I kept thinking, man, I'm, I'm meant for more than this. And I remember watching music groups like pop groups and, and these famous people on the stage. And I used to watch them thinking, you know, why, why can't that be me in some way? Why can't I be that actor? Or obviously, you know, I've not got a very good voice. So I couldn't be a singer. So I always kind of thought, you know, I could do something, but I didn't know what. So that's how it, it, it evolved. And, and I think you got one lie, Steve. For me, I didn't want to be remembered for selling kettles and toasters, no disrespect. But I thought I want to be remembered for something where I've really tested myself. Yeah. Now, obviously, your personality and character, uh, passion, it doesn't matter whether it's, it's a toaster English channel, is obvious. So, so now you, you, you've got, you know, you got five hours swim in. When did you transition to the open water, real open water training in order to go to the English Channel? So after this five months, I, I, yeah, I was coming up to six months. I phoned the local lake, but it was February in England. It's not <laughs> too warm in February. So I phoned up and with my best salesman voice, I said, I, re I want to swim. I'm an open water swimmer. And they said, it's February, it's nine degrees. Uh, this is not a good idea. And I said, it's okay. I'll bring my friend. I know what I'm doing and managed to convince the guy for four sessions. I paid him 20 pounds for four sessions. He said, no one swims in here in the summer, but let alone in February. I said, no, no, it's okay. Anyway, I got into the water, slipped into the water, um, solid to hyperventilate, and out of pure stubbornness, did two kilometers. It really? took me a long time to do two kilometers with wow. very little protection. Wow. I had the thinnest wetsuit you've ever seen in your life. It was like <laughs> a wetsuit. If you, if you uh, had long fingernails, you would break it. It was like half a mil or something. It was ridiculous. And I remember going in and my friend saying, do you want to get out? Which I was like, I'm not getting out. That's a red rag to a brook bull for me. I got to a kilometer, I couldn't feel anything, but I thought I can't feel anything, but I'm still moving, so this is good. And then out of pure stubbornness, did two kilometers. Fortunately for me, they brought a boat out, obviously thinking, why have we let this crazy guy in? They bundled me back in the boat, they took me back, and um, I had five paramedics, and after 45 minutes of a lukewarm shower, I was 34 degrees core temperature. So he said another few minutes and you may have not lasted. Wow. Uh, and I always tell that story with a little bit tongue in cheek because, you know, it's not meant to show people that I'm crazy. It's kind of like, OK, I need to give the sport the respect it deserves. Wait till it's warmer. Really understand what I'm doing. So I waited to the summer and the next two sessions, Dover. I was supposed to go in 20 minutes with Alison Streeter. She lost me somewhere in Dover Harbour. I did three and a half hours by myself. And then the third session, I did six hours where dear Frida Streeter was, I think she thought I was more experienced because you know, Frida's like six hours, just do six hours. And I was like, oh, okay. So my third session ever was six hours. My first session, hypothermia and nearly died. So, you know, stick with stuff, it's worth it. <laughs> Talk about fast tracking. Okay, so you, you get to the shore, uh, you get to the shore, and you're heading toward um, the English Channel, uh, the French coast. Was there, was it easy? Was it hard? Did you hit some, some peaks and valleys? What was that first experience? Amazing. I remember standing on the side of the beach and waiting for the hooter to go off. It was Mike Oram and thinking, oh my God, when did I decide to do this? I'm going to swim to another country. This is, this is not right. Um, but I've done a lot of stuff mentally and 
I think the thing is, like, I got a friend who was a hypnotherapist, and I didn't know what to think of hypnotherapy, but he taught me why you're thinking positive, you can't think negative. And that was kind of like my personality anyway. So he just gave me a few little nuggets to think about. Why are you thinking what you're warm? You can't be thinking you're not warm, which is why I banned the word C-O-L-D. And I still never say it. Um, but yeah, as I got in the water, I kind of kept the devil. I talk about the devil and the angel. And the devil was this big saying, what are you doing? And I just concentrated on my strokes. I got to around about three hours. Everything was good. Then it, in a washing machine started to be sick. I was sick about 20 times. And then I tried to make a joke of it in my head because a friend of mine sponsored me a pound every time I, I was going to be sick. So I thought, well, he owes me 20 pounds. So that's a good thing. So I just tried to give it less power. And I, I always talk about Steve, like, you know, if you make something bigger than you are, then it overwhelms you and it becomes unreachable. But for me, I always joked my way through it. And there was method to the madness. I'd smile through the discomfort, I'd be oh, waving. Okay. And this all offset what I was doing. And I would always go feed to feed. So, you know, a lot of swimmers will talk about it, those checkpoints. And it was like a checkpoint in my mind. But then when I had three miles to go, I asked how long to go. And they said three miles, the, um, the, the co-pilot said, which they looked at him as, why have you told him that? You know, you should never tell someone, as you know, how long to go. An hour and a half later, I thought, well, that's an hour and a half. So three half an hour drinks later, come in, how long to go? Three miles. Uh, oh, no. So I've gone nowhere for an hour. And then my friend said, shut up and keep swimming. And I wanted to kind of strangle him, but I couldn't touch the boat, obviously. <laughs> but I remember going and finishing, and it got to nine hours, ten hours. I decided in that moment, just stop worrying about how long to go, because eventually you'll get across. As long as you yeah. keep moving, you're in control of your own destiny. And the water got thinner. I could still see it now, goosebumps. And I became Frank in that movie. He oh, wow. was on the beach. And I just could see the movie. And I stood up, Steve, with five meters to go. And in the movie, Frank falls backwards. And I fell backwards for no apparent reason, um, like he did in the movie. And I'm like, what am I doing here? I just swam 11 and a half hours. Just walk out, Adam. Yes. So then I walked out. And I was like, what's just happened here? And a French family said, have you just swam from England? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, we think you have. I said, have I? And there's a picture somewhere of me propped up like, like this. So that was it. But, you know, I, it was all gonna, always going to be about one swim. I had a problem with my shoulder having taken a saving water polo. And I decided that, you know, I do this one swim. And I, I looked up at the ocean gods and said, ocean gods, you give me this one swim, this one little thing with all my injuries. And I'll never do this sport ever again, I promise. And that lasted for about a week. Okay, so dial forward a week. Now, how do you get from, you know, thanking the uh, channel gods to Ocean 7? I mean, that's a big well, leap. Well, that's your fault, really, to be honest, by creating Ocean 7. So you, you uh, no, I shouldn't joke because it, it absolutely changed my life. So the next thing actually was before Ocean 7, Gibraltar Strait. So okay. I'd heard about with my friend of mine, this swim Spain to Morocco, and I'd said I wasn't going to do any more. I had this shoulder. I was in a lot of pain. Um, I had an MRI scan, and it took me 18 months. I was still in pain. And anyway, I ended up having two operations on the shoulder, and I was advised not to swim again by my surgeon. Ah. And then I had this in my mind, Gibraltar Straits, but my shoulder was so bad. He said, do you ever want to swim again? The surgeon, I said, yeah, I want to swim from Spain to Morocco. He said, no, 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 no. I don't mean Spain to Morocco. I mean, like in the shallows, do you ever want to swim again? I said, he, he said, I mean for leisure. I said, well, that Spain to Morocco is leisure for me. But anyway, we had this joke and, and that's when I had the two operations and, and of course started developing a new technique. But for Gibraltar Straits, I thought, I have to find a way to get around my body, which is where the ocean walker technique was developed. Ah, uh, okay. Got and it became so, uh, so successful with what I was doing, I expected to be slow and suddenly got faster with this big glide. And uh -huh. anyway, the rest is history with that. But I then thought, my brain said, well, Spain to Morocco, that's 10 miles, it's half the English Channel. Is that a bit of a cop out in my head? Although the tides are very strong, why not go there and back? Because yeah. no British person had done that. And I, and I phoned dear Raphael uh, yeah. and asked him, you know, can I do two ways? He said, uh, no, you're too slow. 
I said, you don't know how fast I am. He said, oh, no, no, only Olympic swimmers and people super fast should go back. It's you have to be over four and a half K now. I said, I can do that. I can do that. So anyway, my stubbornness decided. I didn't look up a lot of information on it. I just decided that's what I was going to do. And then I crossed it, became the first British person to go both ways. The time was the British record one way, yeah. three hours, 25. And wow. And okay. it. Um, so nine hours, obviously it's twice as long yeah, as the way yeah. back as the current. So I didn't really understand fully, uh, but I made it against the odds of it trying to push me right. sideways. And then I got back home and thought, ah, have I got one more swim left in me? And then I looked around, looked at all these swims, and Steve Monotone has uh, created this thing called the Ocean Seven, the toughest seven ocean swims in the world. And I'd done two. So how hard could it be to do another five? So that's how it was born. And of course, Molokai uh, was on that list. And I thought, oh, he's picked a good one here, Hawaii. How tough can Hawaii be? Well, you're yeah. just about to show how tough Hawaii yes, was. Yes. What's this picture? Yes. Uh, uh. So this was. 13 and a half hours in. What happened was, Steve, I, I basically arrived in Hawaii, quick story, the hotel, um, a load of the rooms had caught fire, so they couldn't come back to me and I had to find a room. And so I was like doing it the next day because I arrived two in the morning and at seven in the morning, the pilot said, we're going tomorrow. I said, what oh, do you wow. mean? We need a few days. He said, no, 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 uh, the weather's going to be over 25 knots plus and so we need to go i said well i thought it was 25 knots tomorrow well early 20s early 20s so i was like oh man what do i do and i always agree with myself if i have a 50 50 just go but the but the hotel wasn't answering the phone i booked the flights four seats on the plane scrambling around to you know try and get myself sorted and um anyway i Literally 24 hours after 18 hour flight and time zone difference, I was in the, the water. No way. The oh, wow. And j just for the audience, so we have Molokai Island and we have Oahu, the big or the, the main island where Waikiki is and most of the tourists. And you're swimming from a relatively uh, desolate island to yeah. like tourist central. Um, that seems fairly easy you on a clear most days you can see the islands but you took the longest route in history can you explain yeah. how uh, in the world you landed nearly in uh, on the base of diamond head the very famous volcano everything was going very well up to nine hours uh, nine hours i heard him say is three miles from the finish he's going to break the world record and at that point, I think the world record was 12 hours. I know Darren Miller had it. And I thought, Darren, I'm taking this record down. My friend uh, is a good friend of mine. Yeah. And when I got to that point, I started going faster. And then I went backwards for around about three hours. Then I went sideways for another two hours. And then it went dark. Now, I remember him telling me that if it goes dark, generally it gets you know people out the water. He's done it a number of times, the pilot. But we were so close. And like you say, we're handing for Sandy Beach, but it was strange because he kept heading for Sandy Beach, but I was going backwards. So then we tried Port Lock, then we tried Diamond Head, then it was Diamond Head Lighthouse. Wow. And in the end, I was stung at 13 and a half hours when the, the kayak had got in in the dark. And then I had to swim three and a half hours in complete agony, which is what you see here. And what happened here was so much pain i pulled these two tentacles off the front which you're seeing the the, the two lines at the front and that's yeah. that's all swelling from the stomach that, that was created this was uh. like the day after and i lost feeling in my spine for about an hour and i did three uh, i made a deal with myself and i tried three attempts to carry on swimming i lasted 30 seconds and as i was swimming i was holding my belly barely even a swim stroke and on the third one I said, right, Adam, get level with the boat, and that's a checkpoint to continue. Once you get to the boat, do not stop. And that was my third deal, stretch it out more. It. Though that 30 meters of getting level with the boat seemed to be impossible. And then they reached forward as if to get me out, and I smiled at them, which was very much a grimace. And then my whole body started shaking for the next hour. And, my, and when you're in pain, your head, you want to move, yeah, you know, your yeah. head moves. So it was all seemed lost. And I thought, 
the thing is, Steve, I completed every training session. I got into winning habits. So for me, this was a really odd situation that my brain was telling me to quit. But I said, well, no, I'm in control of my own destiny. And I managed to carry on three and a half hours. We got into a riptide. It never, ever seemed like it was going to finish. And right at the end, there was these rocks coming out near the lighthouse, all out the ground. I cut my leg on a rock, um, and I scraped myself over every rock. I cut my leg open, and I got to the side, and Linda Kaiser, bless her, she, I'd never met her, but spoken to on the phone, because she tried to persuade me not to do the swim. She said, it's, it's 20 odd knots. This is, you know, is it right? Should we be doing it? Anyway, she gave me a hug and she said, no, he doesn't need to go to hospital. He seems to be smiling, I think. Um, and there was a camera in my face. I had maybe 30 ulcers in my mouth. I could hardly speak. And I went, pay that for me. Success lasts for a lifetime. Yeah. And, and that was it, 17 hours. I did 15 kilometers more than I should have done. Yes. It took me it took me 15 minutes in the car, Steve, to where I, the next day where I finished, where I should have finished. And, yes. and I'll tell you what, man, that was, and, and literally couldn't sleep that night. I had seven showers to stem the pain. And, and my whole body is like this. But I looked at the sky and I thought, this pain will subside at some point and no one can take this away from me. Yeah, I mean, that is literally a channel and a half. <laughs> you went from, from that nine hour mark, three miles to go, going to set the world record. And what was the final time? Like 18 hours? Seven, seven, just over 17 hours. And, wow. and, and like, I was in so much hurt as well. Like I could only, you know, the thing at the back of your throat, that dangly thing at the yes. back of your throat, that was choking me down my throat as well as the stings. And I swam uh, visualizing the hot pain as like a blanket, a warm blanket that was keeping me wow. protected. And that's how I disconnected the negativity and made it into thank you. And I started thanking the ocean for testing me. Thank you, thank you, this is making me stronger. And all I kept thinking was, what swim will ever stop me after this? Wow. Now, put it this in perspective, Hawaii is warm water. I mean, it's salty water. So in addition to all of the, you know, cold water training that your body had prepared for suddenly you're in very warm water swimming for over 17 hours i mean that alone is is pushing you to limits and then all of a sudden you got these jellyfish things i mean, I mean yeah i mean I, I nearly took my hat off but i thought no sensible keep it on but the whole thing was supposed to be a positive that it was warm i didn't know that i was going to be stung by a man of war i didn't know that i was going to be in 24 hours later nearly falling asleep at the start um, listening to the pilot stories about sharks and how a cookie cutter shark bit That's one guy's right. calf on the swim before mine. And I was like, man, why am I getting so tortured by this? <laughs> so now you've got three out of the seven down. Yeah. And now you're starting to get into, okay, I got the English channel down, you know, the iconic channel around the world. Okay. Straight at Gibraltar. You're going from continent to continent. Now you've, you've tackled Hawaii. You've tackled the mighty Pacific ocean but there were still some <laughs> major adventures ahead of you. Yeah, well, I mean, the next one, the next one was uh, briefly Catalina, which, which I did, which I thought, this is, this is in the bag, you know, I know what I'm doing, what can go wrong with this? My shoulder packed in uh, halfway, uh, the, the tendon came undone, so I swam oh. one arm for seven hours. So I, halfway, I think I was... Um, just shy of five hours, four and three quarter hours, okay. and it took me 12 and a half hours. So it took me a lot longer the second half. And I had the fire service, the uh, LA fire service cheering me on. The boat came alongside wow. me and they were going, go man, go, I'm going, I'm trying, I'm trying <laughs> with one arm. So that was really nice. So that was finished. Then I had to have the third operation on the shoulder, saw the same surgeon. And he said, you never did that Gibraltar Straits when I told you not to do, did you? And I said, ah, well, I've kind of done a few since then. What? All this, and he kept calling it diseased tissue, you know? Yeah. And I remember when I had the third operation, I went into shock and he said, just please, just no more. And I said, no, 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 we're just getting started here. We're getting started. <laughs> so anyway, we did the Sigari, uh, I booked Sigari Channel okay. having still my arm in a sling. I had oh, nine wow. weeks training. And I thought this is the, one of the smallest of the Ocean 7, yeah. 15 miles, something like that. I thought, as long as the ocean gods are kind to me, I'll be okay. And what you'll see from the video, it might be a little bit, um, not, 
it's not very good on Zoom, is it? Sometimes the video, but yeah. you get the idea of the white water. So this is after 11 hours. I had to sprint for 11 hours, and the pilot um, kept saying, he kept looking at his monitor, and I would have the translator tell me, you have to go faster. And this happened, like, I was sick for the first four hours. Then they said, you've got to go faster. I said, how long? They said, until we tell you to stop. Try half an hour as fast as you can, first of all. So I'd do sprinting for half an hour, and then I would, after that, I would then just take it easy and just just normal speed and then I have to sprint and this went on hour after hour after hour and basically it took me 15 and a half hours but but ocean like I I have never seen it before it was crazy and I just never thought it let me pass you know I was like at one point I shouted at the ocean I said I understand your power, but I will never give up. I will go on for months if I have to. You know, I appreciate you're stronger than me. Now let me get across. And Gemma, my partner on the boat, she said, who are you shouting at? I said, the ocean. I'm letting the ocean know. And she said, she thought, oh, he's gone completely crazy. Um, saw a couple of uh, fin, uh, fins pop up and right. tail whiz and, and, and stuff. Yeah. And I, got, I, I, and I where water. he is. I, I want to put this in, in perspective here. So this is in northern Japan, uh, between the main island of Honshu, where Tokyo and Osaka are, and Hokkaido, where the city of Sapporo is. And it's it's a narrow channel. The the closest point is only nineteen point five kilometers. But if you just think about your vertical displacement <laughs> up and down, you already went thirty kilometers. Oh, I mean, Mika, who's a translator, I came back and I supported another swimmer, which was five years after the anniversary. And she said, I'll never forget your swim. She said, of all the swims that I've crossed, I've never seen anything like that. She said, how you managed to keep going. And uh, the pilot, my friend who, was, who lives in Japan, he spoke in Japanese to him and he, and he said to him, you know, I can't believe this guy is still going. And, and, and sort of like every now and then I would like laugh and try and make a joke because it was so ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, one time, Steve, I was swimming up like a roller coaster <laughs> and I was like, man, what do I do here? What do I actually do? I made one, one stage, I made four and a half kilometers in an hour and another hour I made 800 meters. Yeah. And now, that was going flat out. What, did you start out calm or what happened? Uh, no, well, what happened was we, we waited an hour and a half at the start position where it was rough and he said i think it will get better um and he said tomorrow may be the same maybe worse what do you want to do and it was that 50 50. but i have to confess steve like lots of things didn't go right i was going through some challenges with jobs and, and various different things personal stuff and it's the first time i thought i'm okay with not going i'm okay with not going we'll go tomorrow and i was joking and laughing and the rain was coming inside like then he came out, the sun came out, and he went smiling away. I thought, what's he smiling at? And he was like, you know, basically, I think it will get better. But it got much worse. Oh. And that, that, that channel, and I know this is like um, a favorite of yours. You know, you've got a lot of experience with that channel. I have never seen anything like that. I mean, that channel wanted to punish me to a whole different level that I've never seen before. And, and, and to give you an idea, I reckon my heart rate was 170 to 180 most of the time. Ah. I remember breathing just yes. And it was like a boxer just yeah. battering me, battering me. And, I, and, and all I could see was this little bit of air, which I would grab. And, and I thought to myself, you know, how on earth am I ever going to get across this? But again, count 60 strokes, another 60. Yeah. But I am seriously, seriously stubborn, Steve. Yes, so, say that again. <laughs> now, what most people don't realize is this channel is between the Sea of Japan and the Pacific Ocean. And the Sea of Japan's uh, out, out, uh, height is actually higher than the Pacific Ocean. So it basically acts as a funnel going down. So it's pushing you one way. You're going up and down. Uh, yeah. The wind is, you know, blasting away. I mean, oh, I, I think, I think yeah, I mean, I, I think the they go at different times now, don't they? I remember talking to the pilot and saying, why do we no longer go at 6 a.m.? Oh no, a very bad time to go, a very bad time to go. We have lots of bad conditions. I said, I know, I was one of those people. 
Um, but you, yeah, I mean, the thing is with, you know, joking aside, I don't regret any of that stuff, what happened in Hawaii and Japan, because those two things joint were the toughest for different reasons. But I learned so much about myself and I was hanging in there. In Japan, that first, I'd say hour, two hours, I was like, what am I doing out here? Too many things are not going right for me. I wasn't in the right, you know, normally when I start channel swim, I get in, I kind of sprint to the start, show the ocean that I mean business. I got in in Japan and I floated to the start, touched the rock and my mind wasn't right. But this is proof, even if you think your mind is not right when you're out there, things can change. And what the biggest thing that happened that helped me, believe it or not, was when the pilots said, you've got to go as fast as you can, otherwise it's going to push us and the swim's over. And rather than buckle to that pressure, I thought, okay, this is mad that I'm doing it so early on in the swim. So let's just take each sprint as it comes. Yeah. Um, but I got back in the hotel and I, I was in just, I, I, I like, like a boxer just hit me round after round after round. But I thought I've done it. And that's the thing. That's what swimmers should remember is it's only a day of discomfort. Whatever comes, it's a day of discomfort. It can't be much yeah. more than that for yeah. something that can't be taken away from you. Yeah. Now we go, then there was this other swim you did and it was just from what I, you know, understand. I mean, it was a beautiful swim and we got a picture here. Um, oh yeah. And yeah, if you could so explain where this is. Yeah. The cook straight in New Zealand. So, you know, after three hours of uh, swimming and, and again, I thought this is all going well. I haven't been sick and then gulped some water just as I thought that and started to be sick. Um, I'd had all of three days to acclimatize, which was good for me because Japan was a day and a half, Hawaii was 24 hours. And I thought everything's, you know, and then I started being sick. And, and I looked at the sky, Steve, and I said, oh, please, please give me something positive. Anything, just give me something positive. Then out of nowhere, just this fin, and it's not like in Jaws, the fins are there and suddenly, ah, oh, it's dolphins. So I'm swimming along for about 20 minutes and I've got, I'm flanked either side, one in the middle, few inches in front of my hand amazing I thought what you know what is going on here this is incredible and then I thought my neck's a bit sore because I swim looking down to take pressure off my neck and I looked down and there was a much deeper dolphin that looked a little bit different that was moving a bit different I thought what, what is that why is that dolphin so deep and it was kind of moving with its fins so and I thought that's a different fin ah it's not a dolphin um so then I remember the hypnotherapist saying to me choose what you focus on you know and at this moment do i focus on the dolphins or do i focus on the shark so i chose the dolphins and and when i came in for a drink um for half an hour i had a drink and the dolphins float are floating around if anyone wants to look at it if they google adam walker swimming with dolphins and and it was absolutely incredible these are called dusky dolphins and after an hour and a half i remember um I remember the pilot saying, he said to me, look, you know, you're losing time because you're trying to, you're looking at dolphins, you know, we need to kind of knuckle down. And I, I thought, oh yeah, he's right. So in my head, I went, thanks dolphins for your support, but I really must press on. And then within five seconds, they were gone forever. Really? Like, Literally, <laughs> the minute I said that in my head, Steve, I promise you, they're gone. And, but they waited on three separate feeds, they waited for me and one, would would circle me uh -huh. uh, and dolphins when they circle they circle their young to protect i've since found okay. out and one would get closer and and at one point after now i thought ah, i really you know i shouldn't touch the you know but yeah. i see how close i can get and i'm on a wave and the dolphin went like this hardly even move and i thought man this is demotivating the dolphin's not moving i'm going as fast as i can and one slid on its side and for literally 10 minutes looked at me with its eye. Wow. And I, I literally could have burst into tears. It was the most emotional thing. And I thought somebody's rewarding me here. And of course I was focused so much on the dolphins. Then I looked down and, and, and that was it. No shot, but I'll always be grateful for the dolphins. And, and what makes it even more spectacular is I did six ocean swims for well and dolphin conservation. So my swims were in order to protect wells and dolphins. And then in this moment, the dolphins, you know, we don't know whether they saved me or not. People have asked me around the world, you know, did they save you? Did they not? I say, look, I don't speak dolphin language, 
but all I can say is how I felt, which I felt very secure, very protected. And since then, I, I, I hosted a documentary on dolphin intelligence I was invited to do with scientists. And they proved a lot of dolphin intelligence of, you know, they, they would have tuned into you. They would have felt, yeah. your, you know, that you needed support. Wow. How many dolphins were there? Just did we... Around about a dozen, 12 wow. dolphins, I would okay. say. Yeah. And that, that picture, you know, my partner took it with a cheap camera. And when I finished, I, I finished that swim, um, eight and a half hours and I got out. It was one of the few swims I was shivering. And to, to motivate me to give, uh, as a good thing, she said, let's have a look at these pictures. And she said, oh, that's a pretty good one. I said, pretty good one? The dolphin's in midair. I'm breathing at the side. Yeah, and then of course it went viral. Yeah, I sent it to the charity. Uh -huh. I didn't even really post it. I sent it to a charity. They they contacted the Daily Mail or the Daily Mail contacted me at two in the morning, and I had this call saying, "Is that real?" I said, "What?" Well, well, I, I thought he was joking. I was like, well, "What do you mean?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think I've superimposed the dog? He said, "Oh, it looks too perfect." I said, "Oh, I'll tell my partner that. She'll be really pleased to hear that." But yeah, really incredible experience. I'll always be so grateful for that moment. Yeah, and the, the uh, so that was the fifth swim. Uh, six. Six, so sorry. Was, so you yeah, had one cool. big one left, one yeah. really big one. And Everybody that told one. me, I'm too thin, you'll die, you have to put more weight on all these emotional vampires, meaning well, but trying to play with your head. Everybody's saying how COLD it was. and yeah. But I've been through um, pretty much everything that an ocean could throw at you, I feel. Yeah. So this, I thought, and again, my, my training partner said, oh, you've done those swims, but you haven't done the North Channel. So all I kept thinking was, I can't wait to tell him how straightforward this swim is. Because everybody puts this swim on a pedestal, making it you know, almost unreachable. I'm going to be the man who shows it is reachable for those others mentally. But of course, seven years have been told, uh, or X amount of years have been told it's, it's tough then it kind of stays with you. So when I jumped in, it was like jumping in acid, like this is this extreme COLD experience. Uh, uh, sorry, were you starting from North Ireland or Scotland? Which, which place, which country uh, did you? From North, yeah, from Donegadee to Port okay. Patrick. Got it. So okay. yeah, so I jumped in, kind of got over the fact in the first hour, the temperature. Oh, about an hour and 15 minutes in, I was so barricaded with jellyfish I've never seen so many jellyfish in one ocean. I need to. I'm sure they've gone away now. For anyone who wants to do the North Channel, um, but at one point I felt like Sylvester Stallone in Rambo Three. I was surrounded, and I kind of turned round and went backwards. And they said, "What are you doing?" Like Scotland's that way. I was saying, "There's jellyfish." He said, "Forget it. Just swim through them." I was like, "Ah, oh, easy for you to say." So anyway, I missed a few, got a few little clips. I was okay. And it was like a computer game, gamble left, maybe. I mean, it's an ocean, but my brain is going, go left, go right. And it disrupted me a little bit with my rhythm because I was keeping my wits about me. Um, but I remember my, towards the end, my partner, who's for the hug that you can see there, she drew a picture of a whale. And I thought she was saying, do it for the whales, Adam. And I was going, I'm doing it for the whales, I'm doing it for the whales. And she was going, no, no, no. There's a whale next to you. There's a whale next to you. I was like, yes, I know. I'm doing it for the whales. No, no, no. You're not hearing me. So there was a whale floating a couple of hundred yards away. And I, I got within three kilometers. I was eight hours. I knew wow. the record wow. it was nine hours, 35 minutes. And I thought, oh, man, I just have to do less than an hour. 3K, that's a doddle. That's just easy. What a way to finish the Ocean 7. I'm going to be rewarded after all this with the record for the North Channel. And then, of course, the Ocean Gods have to have their last say. And as soon as I thought that, they started pushing me sideways. And my brother, who had driven six hours to see me finish, and we told him where I was finishing, he was in a house up on the, on the rocks, knocking on the door to get the view. And he just watched me go sideways. Um, for another three miles or so. So, yeah, ended up 10 hours 45. Okay, but okay. In a way, it was it was supposed to be that way. Yes, and, and this is a, a congratulatory hug at the end of the... Uh, the yeah, this meant a lot. My, 
my partner Gemma, who's been through a lot with me, we set up Ocean Walker. So we we ended up from this misfortune, we ended up um, creating uh, this swim, swim technique to help others, um, which which was by default. Um, I, I ended up getting invited for a swim for peace with uh, Nedjib, a Tunisian swimmer. Yeah. And there was a lot of top swimmers there, including the assistant coach of the Malta Olympic team. And they all started seeing me swim and saying, how do you swim like this? Show me, you must show me. So then from that, I thought, well, I, I, maybe I should put a camp on, a group, a small group. And, and, and I ended up doing a group in Malta as well. And that's how I started coaching. And that's when I gave up the job selling appliances and an Ocean Walker was born. An Ocean Walker, I'll admit this, I'll give my father-in-law credit for this. We did our second camp ever and we signed in into a hotel and there was a book called Fell Walker. And he's a farmer, nothing to do with marketing. And he said, you should be Ocean Walker. And I'm like, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? So that's how Ocean Walker was born. And, and uh, Phil's just, you know, just so privileged, privileged that found the Ocean 7. So, uh, you know, and you were, you were responsible for that, Steve. So I'll always feel very grateful for that. Um, the fact that I've been able to then move on into doing something that I love. I always wanted to be a coach, but I thought, how can I get a business out of that? So my next phase of my life has been, and actually when I was from the North Channel, I was thinking, right, when this is finished, I now need to think about coaching and supporting people and, and all that side of it. And I've been really privileged. You know, I've, I went to Kona, I coached the Prince of Bahrain. I've, oh, I've wow. had amazing experiences with, with people and all because I had a bad shoulder. And if I hadn't had that bad shoulder, I wouldn't have been as strong as I am. I, I guess, you know, the coaching may not have come through with this particular technique. And um, and now I'm building my own facility to help others. Really? Oh, wow. Where is that? Uh, Lincolnshire, UK. So I, I bought in, in typical Adam style these days. Uh, I saw a lake. My, my partner showed me a picture of a lake uh, surrounded by a log cabin in landlocked Newark on Trent uh, in, in England. And I said, oh, my God, we need to buy it. I didn't know how much it was. Tried to buy it. Didn't buy it. Missed out by a day. And we were a bit upset. And I said, let's not dwell on this. We'll build our own. And then I looked every day and found this old goat farm that made goat cheese. And I walked through the door, which is here. Didn't really care about the, the lounge, the dining room, just wanted to see outside and went, ah, here's 10 acres I can build my own lake and help others. So this is gonna become a, a well-being. Um, so I'm getting um, an endless pool. Oh, so wow. for winter okay. swimming, yeah. I'm getting a lake which will be around about 750 meters. And then for meditation, and, and of course what's happening now in the world, this will really help people with well-being because we'll be able to do yoga pilates yes. and that's the next phase of my life really um wow. what, what do you call it what, what will it be called and when will it open yeah well we'll it'll be open uh, next year so next year will be um will, will be the time it'll be um we're, we're just adjusting the names at the moment and looking at but it's going to be uh, the um ocean walker health and well-being center i believe so you've got that nice. hot off the press and um and what's amazing is it's it's uh the, the ground is is very much a, a, a therapeutic ground so it's crystal under there so people will be okay. swimming over crystal um and uh, a crystal called citrine which is which is very good for depression and okay. and, and health benefits so yeah i mean people keep asking me you know when's your next swim and I, i'm a bit busy at the moment i, I did an ice swim a couple of years ago i did an ice smile and 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 a few other ones and you know i'm kind of like yeah I'm, I'm pretty busy helping others which i really enjoy to do but if that swim comes along or steve monotones creates uh, something else which sends me on a journey for another eight years of my life um but please hang on for a little while yeah no this this new um wellness is great and i also wanted to share with people your great book i mean it really man versus ocean um I mean, just explain about this. This is yeah, a really I, nice book. I mean, I, I 
every word is mine. Um, you know, I wanted it to be from the heart so you could almost hear my voice talking to you throughout it. Never envisaged in my wildest dreams writing a book. It's not something that, you know, just if someone said to me 10 years ago, you'll write a book, I'd say, come on, man. It's, you know, when I did my, dis my dissertation, which was 10,000 words, I think I had an extension for about four weeks uh, because I couldn't knuckle down and, and do it. So I had 75,000 words. I had them all kind of in my head. I, I finished at 76,000 to the, to the dot. And, and my hope is that even if you're not a swimmer, you read it, and all these swims really were a metaphor for life. So the toaster salesman trying to achieve his dream, it doesn't even have to be swimming, but you'll see the battles. And I'm very open about the battles that I had, how I had to overcome them. And, and I'd like people to read it and just realize that what is possible, because sometimes people go to me and say, oh, Adam, oh, God, God, you know, you, this swimmer that was born in the ocean. I was like, come on, man, that is not the truth. I was not a front crawl swimmer. I was never picked for races for front crawl. I think I did relays if they were desperate for one length. I did backstroke. So there was nothing there that said I could do this. And if a guy who's had three operations on his shoulder, two dislocations, two operations on his knees, um, can do this with no coach, what can everybody else do? Yeah, no, this is, this is truly inspirational. I mean, it's, it's been a... It's been a joy watching your journey. It's been an even greater joy seeing how you transitioned from this former life, um, as satisfying as it was, to this, which you're now, now you're on TV. Now you're on book. So when you, you envisioned yourself on in the public eye, you certainly have achieved that. And it, it's really, really nice to see. It's really an inspiration to many. I really appreciate that. And, and as I say, you're a, you're a big reason in that with creating Ocean 7. And, and I never, you know, 10 years ago, as I say, to, to find myself in this world is, is unbelievable. And I remember, you know, working at a factory watching um, out the window with buyers shouting at me about toasters and things and thinking, man, I just know I'm capable of something. And the important thing here is, like I'm known now as the ocean swimmer, ocean walker, but I see myself as a guy who, you know, swimming was something that I really enjoyed when I was younger. I could get around things with the injuries that I had. And, you know, and that's how it was meant to be. You know, my mum said to me, oh, imagine if you weren't injured, you know, you could have done the Olympics, you could have done this, that. And I said, no, no, you know, I'm one of X amount of people, the first British person to swim the ocean. So that to me means so much. And that is the journey. And I think everybody, no matter what age you are, you're never too old to start something. Whether you know, people say to me, "Oh, can I learn your stroke at 60 or 70?" I was like, "Of course you can." You know, you never finish. You never finished. And you know, the biggest, the biggest fear I had, things that I've learned from all this, which is, don't be afraid of following your dreams. The biggest fear I had, as I say, at university was public speaking, and now I end up doing it as a job. I've done acting. I never would have, I'd have been so embarrassed to do acting and I've tried my, you know, I've, I've done a few things there. I've been on TV, been interviewed and I'm like this excited kid still. Yes. I'm very blessed, very appreciative, but you, good things happen if you don't give up and you just keep pushing. Yeah. But I never imagined from Ocean 7, this would all happen. So uh anybody supporting me thank you very much and and also thank you to you steve in particular because you know ocean seven pinged up on my radar and and the rest is history yeah well where can people reach you um i mean you're obviously a, a very inspirational guy is there a website is there a uh obviously your wellness center is going to open up next year yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if people are on Instagram, Adam Ocean Walker, they can, okay. they can find me on Instagram. Um, it's oceanwalkeruk.com. We've literally just launched a new website yesterday. So you can see we have merchandise. And, and if people want to learn the technique, I have an online system if they're in other countries and they can, they can learn one-to-one -one and, and camps. I go all around the world now with camps. So Maldives, Turkey, Malta, obviously in the UK, I'll do more with, with the lake. Um, so yeah, but you know, info at oceanwalkeruk.com if you want to drop me an email, but you'll find me online 
And I'm always willing to help, you know, anyone who's got any doubt or is 50-50 about doing this amazing sport. You know, maybe it's not easy at times, but nothing great is easy. One, uh, an amazing guy who started all this journey, Captain Webb, said that, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for everything and, and good luck on everything in the future. Good luck to you and everybody listening. Thank you for listening. And uh, as the band says, if you can read it, never give up on your dreams is on there. Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Take, Take care. care.